When Samurai Cop premiered on Polish video in 1991, hardly anybody noticed and even fewer people cared. The still smaller number who actually saw the film couldn't agree whether it was a rough cut or a cheap joke, though they came to the same conclusion either way. Bad. Real bad. But 13 years later, and back in the land of its birth, a series of unlikely events began to unfold. Events that would catapult this strange brew of schlock, smut and awkwardness to a level of popularity almost as improbable as its dialogue. I feel like somebody stuck a big club up my ass. Holy s***. That's very nice. This is the story behind Samurai Cop, and it couldn't care less whether you believe it or not. Yamaha, Yamaha, whatever his name is. And they call you Samurai? Oh, really? Bingo. Shut up. What does Katana mean? It is not for us to decide. Here comes the boss. What the hell are you? I'm an undercover cop. I want you to kill him and I want you to kill every one of his men. Bang. Well, this one's dead too. That's why they buy insurance. Right on. <laughs> Keep it warm. We have some problems in the police department. This kid they call the Samurai Cop. The unlikely tale of Samurai Cop begins with Iranian filmmaker Amir Shervan, who was born in Tehran in 1929 and first went to America to study the performing arts in the late 40s. After returning home, he began a career as an actor. This is him in melodrama Zemzemiyi Mahabat, before diversifying into writing and directing, his first completed movie being A Man from Isfahan, a love story about singing welders. <laughs> I guess it features some of the elements his later American movies would be known for, namely blistering action and lascivious voyeurism, but it's fair to call it a hard watch for those not versed in the cinematic aesthetic. During the 70s, Shervan cemented his position as a leading light in the Iranian film industry, his movies becoming increasingly similar to those he'd eventually make in the West. But his world came tumbling down with the Islamic Revolution of 1979. Can we get rid of this Ayatollah t-shirt? Khomeini died years ago. But Marge, it works on any Ayatollah. Got to lighten this bit up somehow. Shervan's Americanized and rather saucy approach ruled him out of a place in the new hardline regime. So he relocated his young family to America and joined an expat filmmaking community that included Dangerous Men director Jahanga Salehi and DOP Petros Palian, the former official photographer for the Shah who would lens all of Shervan's subsequent films. After settling in, the director set up production company Hollywood Royal Pictures and made his first American movie. Three people are dead, one officer wounded, and McKay is still in the john puking his guts out. You're a f***ing maniac, Turkey. In addition to its irascible police captain, Hollywood Cop features most of the traits that would come to define all five of Shervan's US films, from its awkward limb-chopping action to its awkward, unnatural dialogue. Look, mister, I know this guy's just your wife, but he's our prisoner now, so how about backing off, okay? The following year's Killing American Style features a similar bad guys menacing a kid plot and marks his first collaboration with Robert Zadar, who came out guns blazing. I can do anything I want, and you can't do a goddamn thing about it. Meanwhile, 1989's Young Rebels is like a samurai cop dry run with a pair of contrasting good guys taking on a drug cartel, but it might be more notable for featuring Aldo Ray's penultimate film performance. I better watch my f***ing language. And 1990's Gypsy mixes things up a little with a rural setting and a peace-loving hero, but there's still plenty of Shervan violence. My God, that means more dead bodies. But of course, despite their relative merits, all these movies are just foreshadowing for the ultimate payoff that is Samurai Cop. Would you like to f*** me? Bingo. A man is innocent until he's proven guilty. You have nothing on me. Oh, I got a lot of shit on you. Like so many of the most tonally innovative, low-budget filmmakers of the era, 
Shervan was essentially a migrant making American films for American audiences, but he was particularly determined to conjure a sense of Americana, despite not grasping the dialect. Now I'm telling these son of a bitches that we respect the Japanese of this country who are honest businessmen. And yeah, this is the land of opportunity for legitimate business, not for death merchants who distribute drugs to our children through schools and on the streets. His first few Hollywood movies are like red, white and blue apple pies baked in an oven of freedom on the 4th of July, by which I mean they don't make sense, so he decided to borrow a model that was already tried and tested on American audiences, and that's where Lethal Weapon came in. You ever met anybody you didn't kill? The bad guys don't stand a chance. Well, I haven't killed you yet. The idea of pairing a white cop with an edge and a black cop with a tie might not seem hugely insightful, and Shervan had come close to the dynamic before, but he had a much clearer picture this time, and in late 1989 he sat down in his Silver Lake office to write it up. <laughs> we have no way of knowing exactly what manner of magic took place over the ensuing hours, or perhaps even days, but despite evidence to the contrary, a script did emerge, and it was christened Samurai Cop. Samurai? If he's a samurai, what the hell are you? For funding, Shervan turned to Italian media executive Orlando Corradi, whose company Doro TV Merchandising imported Japanese anime shows to Europe. Corradi would later make his fortune producing knockoff animated movies that must have put him higher up Disney's hit list than Video Brinchetto. The guy was a one man borrowing blockbusters. Sheer Khan must be up to something. I didn't give permission to laugh! A figure likely in the region of $20,000 also came from regular Shervan backer Dr. Joselito Rescoba, aka Samurai Cop's Crazy Waiter. Al pozo fa el Federico Sebastian. This is my first name. Yep, not only is this guy one of the movie's main investors, he's also a licensed medical professional. That's in addition to acting in most of Shervan's other movies. In Gypsy, he plays a Native American tracker. I'm not a fighter, I'm a lover. With the money in place, Shervan turned to the matter of casting, which involved bringing all the actors he'd worked with before to see if any were optimistic enough to do it again. Robert Zadar wasn't sure, having failed to enjoy his experiences on killing American style and young rebels. But the promise of an envelope full of cash at the start of each day did wonders for his outlook. Give me another chance. Another chance? You weren't good enough for the job in the first place. He signed on to play villainous samurai Yamashita, despite not being Japanese, and despite his career being on the up, having recently parlayed a memorable role in B-movie Maniac Cop into a memorable role in blockbuster Tango and Cash. On the streets, this pig and his cop friends broke my ribs, my leg and my jaw. You broke that jaw? Crime boss Fuji Fujiyama was more ethnically authentic, played as he was by Japanese-American Cranston Kamuro, an investigator for the Los Angeles County Rent Stabilization Unit, who Shervan spotted while shopping in a Glendale mall. He'd never acted before and initially declined the offer to start with a character named Fuji Fujiyama. But the director didn't take no for an answer, and technically the rest is history. I want him dead! I want his head cut off and brought here! I want his head on this piano! So that every man in my organization understands once more that no katana gets captured alive or talks. I will bring you his head and I will place it on your piano. Better known to movie fans was Gerald Okamura, who was cast as Okamura, a rival to Yamashita as Fujiyama's right-hand man. <laughs> the Hawaiian-born martial artist had appeared in an even more diverse range of movies than Zadar, most notably Big Trouble in Little China and most absurdly Angel of Heat, in which he's German for some reason. Uh, how long will he be out? Forever, and there I saw it to say, this blow brushed the vertebrae artery feeding to the brain. Hmm? Initially hired only to act, his responsibilities would extend to fight choreography when Shervan realized fight choreography was a thing. Don't blame him for things like this, though. He was given just 20 minutes to plan out the climactic showdown between Joe and Yamashita. Four members of Fujiyama's gang were rounded out by Cameron Oppenheimer as female henchwoman. 
The former Vegas showgirl was just starting out as an actress, her only previous experience being a dialogue-free but amusing bit part in Columbo, and a few also dialogue-free, low-profile background roles, most significantly as Ensign Kellogg in several episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation, where her job was to stand up straight in the background and occasionally get hit on by Riker. Commander Riker's easygoing manner and sense of humor is fascinating to me. I believe it to be one reason he is so popular among the crew. It may also be partly responsible for his success in matters of love. For the irascible Captain Roma, Shervan turned to veteran actor Dale Cummings, whose career had peaked two decades earlier when he starred in a series of Italian war movies. Like Zadar and a number of his fellow cops, he'd worked with Shervan before, giving a memorable performance as crime boss Bob Houston in Gypsy. Go get the barber. I hate this beard. Former bodybuilder and channel favourite Jimmy Williams came on board to play the also fairly irascible Sergeant Johnson, having previously appeared in low-budget genre movies including the brilliantly rubbish Cybernator and Killing American Style, in which he played a character named Looney and performed the best on-screen death Shervan ever filmed. B-movie siren Melissa Moore was cast as Peggy, another in a series of thankless, frequently topless roles, the highlight of which might be Jim Wynorski's comedic serial killer Hokum Hard to Die. Is this thing working or what? Prior to Samurai Cop, Janice Farley was an in-demand commercial and fashion model who'd fronted campaigns for brands including Budweiser, but hadn't acted before, which is surprising considering she gives the most professional performance in the movie as a love interest, restauranteur, and discerning churchgoer, Jennifer. Sunday I go to church. What church do you go to? The Episcopal Church in Beverly Hills. Ah, the Episcopal Church. That's very nice. Mark Fraser had acted before, having spent years on the New York stage. A man of many talents, prior to trying to make it as a thespian, he'd earned a basketball scholarship to Columbia, a master's degree in marketing, and a six-figure salary as an accounts executive at CBS, none of which would have prepared him for Shervan's dialogue. <laughs> With all his money and success, he's not as smart as I am. To do what? <laughs> Put on a bulletproof vest, man. He found moderate success and made a fleeting screen appearance as a background pimp in Sergio Leone's Once Upon a Time in America, before scoring a more substantial role on soap opera Another World, and then moving to LA to get into movies proper, although a small part in an episode of generic TV cop show Hunter was his only reward. He's been shot! At least that is until 1990, when his agent sent him to a casting call put out by a certain Hollywood Royal Pictures, and he won what must have appeared to be the plum role of Lieutenant Washington. Hey, take it easy, man. What, what do you want? I can you kill you now, or I can relieve you of this gift, this black gift. In a split second, you won't enjoy yourself the rest of your life. But of course, the plummest of roles was that of our eponymous hero, so enter the samurai cop. His real name is Joe Marshall. He speaks fluent Japanese. He got his martial arts training from the masters in Japan. He was brought over here from the police force in San Diego to fight us. Matthew Hannon was born in Oregon in 1964 and spent his formative years preoccupied with action movies, especially the Rocky franchise. After graduating high school in 1982, here he is on the way to the prom with future wife Stephanie, his lawyer father loaned he and an elder brother the money to buy the local national video franchise. And for the next few years, the younger Hannon fronted the store, attended acting classes, boxed and pumped iron, building up his body in preparation for an assault on the movie business. It's big. He finally headed to Hollywood in 1987, signing up at the famous Santa Monica Bodybuilding Center where he hoped to be spotted by regular Sylvester Stallone. But that proved too pipe-like of a dream, although he did win a pretty good second prize when an encounter with a friend of a friend led to the offer of a gig on Stallone's bodyguard detail. To live in. At 6 foot 3 and 270 pounds, Hannon had already found work in stadium security, but the chance to shepherd Sly beat grappling with drunk sports fans and he jumped at it streamlining his physique and training in what would now be called MMA. 
Spending the next two years at the side of one of Hollywood's biggest stars only served to reinforce the desire to make it himself. So he scored an agent, began attending auditions, and soon landed a lead role in crime thriller American Revenge, a shot on video travesty in which he plays a drug dealer with the sideline kidnapping beauty queens. Those aren't beauty queens in there. They're church girls, and there's a guy in there. Church girls? Guy? What guy? Church girls? Oh! Take this idiot, show me what I want done, and I want it done right. Do you understand? Consider it done, boss. To be fair, he's no worse than anyone else in the movie, which makes Samurai Cop look like Robocop, and was made by Las Vegas bloodbath director David Schwartz, who we see repeatedly reflected in Matt's shades, and also here more than once issuing instructions from behind the camera. Right. Come in. That's in the final cut of the movie. Feeling there had to be a better way forward, Hannon drew advice from those around him, including Stallone, right-hand man Mike DeLuca, and crucially fellow bodyguard Voyo Gorick, the sometime actor, street fighter, and former Yugoslavian mob enforcer who introduced him to Shervan. Is there a problem, sir? No, no, no. Absolutely not. Serendipitously, this was May 1990, and the filmmaker was on the lookout for a buff guy with long hair to be his samurai cop. Hannon made an appointment and was cast somewhere between the front door and Shervan's desk, leaving a few minutes later without even learning what movie he'd be appearing in. It is not for us to decide. It is up to the boss. It's the order of Katana. And with that, the pieces were all in place. At what cost and how many lives? Shoot! Shoot! Shoot him! Shoot! Shoot him! Shervan began filming in June of 1990 with the scene in which Fujiyama and his gang talk gang business in front of Hannon and Farley who were running lines on the tennis court in the background. And to begin with, all seemed fine-ish. There appeared to be a real budget and despite the production being non-union, there was also a full crew. Oh really? Where? The plan was to be done in three weeks, which is about how long the money and everyone's goodwill lasted. Shooting continued on and off throughout the summer, with each new burst involving fewer crew members than the last as money became increasingly tight. It's a downhill situation. Even at the start, filming locations were spread all over LA, with scenes jumping around between them. We can maybe give the opening car chase a pass for starting here, heading 30 miles south to here, then ricocheting back and forth between here and here for a while, only to lurch down here on the way here. Because it could have been longer than we see, although to justify Frank's multiple outfit changes it would need to have lasted several days. By my reckoning, he switches between grey sports jacket and jeans and blue suit and tie at least five times. <laughs> and to explain the van driver evolving from this middle-aged chap with a moustache into this much younger, clean-shaven one, it would need to have lasted about 20 years and happened backwards. Incidentally, there was no rehearsal, training or safety provision made for this scene, and when the actors lifted the blanket, the stuntman was still on fire. Presumably that's when his face and lips were burnt off, because they looked fine at this point. Do you think he'd be able to answer a few questions? No way, his lips are burned. So what, he'll never be able to talk again? The location lottery is even more noticeable in the variety of LA properties used for filming, and more notorious because so many appear over and over again. For example, Okamura's house was played by a residence in Glendale, except when it was a place nearby in the San Fernando Valley. That's where the dastardly henchman jumps out of his kitchen window, only to land in a garden in Malibu before making his way back to the San Fernando Valley on his way out to the Angeles National Forest, before returning to his garden in Malibu to be shot. And that's the same garden in Malibu where... Joe and Frank go over and under the fence on their way into Fujiyama's garden, which is also a garden in Malibu, but not the same garden in Malibu as Okamura's garden in Malibu, which as we've established was mainly in the San Fernando Valley anyway. But in a rare moment of coherence, the bit of Fujiyama's garden that's in Malibu actually belongs to the house it belongs to, a mansion that features the pool, tennis court and piano where Fujiyama keeps his decapitated heads. The granny annex part of the mansion where Joe and Frank conduct their shootout though is unsurprisingly not part of the Malibu mansion. That's a house at the intersection of Beverly Boulevard and Commonwealth Avenue that Shervan used for his office, the car park of which... played the car park of the restaurant where Joe and Frank confront Fujiyama, the interior of which was the Carlos and Charlie's on Sunset, and the nightclub upstairs where Joe's attack really is upstairs, but the adjoining office with the knitted lion's head isn't. That's a house a mile and a half away in Venice Beach, a house in Venice Beach which also played... 
Joe's Sex Pad and Birthday Cake Emporium, or at least it's inside. Its outside is actually a place near Calabasas. And here's where things begin to get a bit silly, because this unassuming suburban bungalow has about half a dozen different roles, including a cameo as Fujiyama's office, but more prominently is home to almost every cop in the movie. Naturally, Joe's got the backyard, so there's room to practice his swordsmanship, while Frank lives in the dining room, Peggy in the kitchen, and unlikely Kung Fu champion Sergeant Johnson in the living room. I want to know where your samurai friend is, and I want to know now. I don't know. We're not good friends. It's this scene that allows us to finally identify the owner of the ubiquitous house near Calabasas. Because if you spend long enough searching online for these magazines, you'll find what they have in common are cover features on martial artist Grandmaster Eric Lee, a multiple kata champion, former action star, and good friend of Gerald Okamura. Here they are together in the Master Demon. <laughs> For the actors, knowing where they were meant to report on any given morning was usually a mystery up until half an hour before filming began, at which point Chervan would call with instructions and everyone would scramble to get there on time. How do we know that this is the right house? This was because footage had to be grabbed as and when property owners or law enforcers allowed, due inevitably to everything being shot guerrilla style. For example, this is a real police station and a real cop who actually approached the crew to check their permit to film. And while Shervan pretended someone was looking for it, he talked the innocent officer into a cameo, a moment that perfectly sums up his attitude to the rules of film. I don't give a damn. And filming. I don't give a f Plenty of other locations have been identified by eagle-eyed fans over the years, and there are websites documenting even the most fleeting of them. For the hardcore among us, it can be interesting to see how some places have or haven't changed. For example, the Carlos and Charlie's is now the site of a confusing-looking office building, which ironically boasts of its secure parking. How times have changed. Freeze your Leave them alone. Uncuff them. I'm in. Uncuff them. Damn. Incidentally, this Leave Him Alone guy, who's known as Percy, was played by Hannon's good friend Tom Gleason, a fellow bodyguard who went on to work for O.J. Simpson and was chief of his home security when Simpson's wife was murdered. During the following trial, he worked as his personal bodyguard and actually drove him away from the courthouse on the day he was acquitted of murder. Leave him alone! Beyond the relentless recycling of locations, Shervan also saved time and therefore money on setups by often keeping the camera in one place while actors cycled around in front of it. Which is especially obvious during the final fight when we cut directly from Joe to Yamashita and the background doesn't change. More traditional economies were made too, with the cast wearing their own clothes in almost every scene, including this one. And naturally, that principle was pushed to the limit, with Hannon using his own handgun, the bad guys using the director's own van, and everyone else driving their own cars, apart from when they were driving Frasers. The former resident of New York wasn't comfortable behind the wheel, which explains why Joe does the driving, despite it being Frank's car. God, man, look what they've done to my car. Captain Roman's gonna burn my ass. Yeah, he's gonna burn it. Charcoal black. <laughs> it is black. Right on. <laughs> Production wrapped for the first time in August 1990, at which point Shervan assembled his footage and realised he was missing about 20% of the movie. I feel like somebody stuck a big club up my ass, and it hurts. I've got to figure out a way to get it out of there. Good job, guys. Call for a celebration. You got it. I'll see you back at your place. The biggest problem was the restaurant scene, because a complete reel of negative had proved either unusable or unavailable, possibly due to it being withheld by the film processing lab in lieu of unpaid bills. That's only speculation, but it was a common occurrence for such fly-by-night productions. I'll sue you and the department for this insult to my client. So in November, Shervan called Hannon, Fraser and Joselito Rescober into his office to refilm their close-ups. But Hannon had had enough by this point. Made to repeat his entire monologue standing between a photocopier and a coffee pot, he did it with a startling ambivalence. Now I'm telling these mother that if they continue killing our children to make their precious millions that they deposit in their secret Swiss bank accounts, Counselor, 
Before your lawsuit even gets off the court clerk's desk, I'll have their stinking bodies in garbage bags and ship them back to Japan for fertilizer. On his return to the editing room, Shervan found he was now missing only about 15% of the movie. So once again, the call went out. But this time, Hannon and Fraser were ready to say no. The ever-persuasive director made a strong case though, namely they wouldn't get their all-important showreel footage if the movie wasn't finished, so they were forced to return. But there was a problem. I walk in and he just flips out. You fucked up my film, where's your hair? I go, what are you talking about? We're done. No, I have more to do! Hannon's agent had convinced him to cut his long hair short and go for a different look. Shervan was initially bereft, but lightened up after a trip to a wig store, where a lady's hairpiece was deemed the ideal solution to the problem. Hannon thought the idea ridiculous, but so badly wanted it all to be over that he went along with it. And besides, Shervan had assured him he only needed to appear in a couple of long shots. Not only did that prove incorrect, but the inevitable close-ups were some of the most nonsensical yet, feeling more like recycled outtakes than reshoots. This man has been here one week and I almost lost my job. If he's here one more week, I might well end up in jail and die of a heart attack, and I don't like that. Hey, I've been here one week. And just how long will it take you to bring him to their knees? One week? In the end, they spent two weeks in late January filming the Grandma's Annex stuff, the scene in the editing facility and parts of the car chase, Jovi Okamura fight, and assault on Fujiyama's cabin, during which time Hannon's despondency turned to disbelief. Tensions were fraught all round as he arrived at a remote spot in the Angeles National Forest to shoot the second half of his fight with Okamura which began eight months earlier and 30 miles away in Malibu. In a perfect illustration of the prevailing vibe on this final day of filming, nobody even suggested a second take when Okamura accidentally pulled the wig off his head. Wig! Wig! Dong, dong, dong! The approach to post-production was as erratic as the approach to the shoot, with negative processed and printed in fits and starts, which leaves the colour timing all over the place. Usually, issues like this would be resolved with reprints, but there was no money for anything like that, or indeed for consistent film stock and lights, which adds to the problem. And of course, different light levels at different locations didn't help either, especially when the location changes in the middle of a punch. Three, two, one, and... For music, Shervan turned to composer Alan Demoderosian, who'd delivered strikingly similar scores for his previous two films, in addition to other Stone Cold classics like High Kicks and Terror in Beverly Hills. He also cameos under an alias as Fujiyama's lawyer. Captain Roma, let me warn you. you and your client. And you get your ass out of my office, or you'll have to go to surgery to get my foot out of it. The main theme was written and recorded in under a day, and the process of ADR or looping was just as rushed. Most of it was done in November, with the director, also a trained actor, remember, dubbing almost all the minor characters, which, once you notice it, is kind of obvious. In no way we go under Fujiyama's flag. You know the code of the Bushida? They'll come with the boat. Yeah, yeah. But even he wasn't misguided enough to dub the female voices, instead drafting in anyone who happened to be around. Notably, Cameron Oppenheimer occasionally stands in for Melissa Moore, who wasn't always available for the ADR sessions. I'm landing. And also for Janice Farley, sometimes even when Jennifer hasn't said anything. But my visit today is simply social. Why? While Hannon's then wife Stephanie voices the receptionist at the post facility. He's upstairs with my boss. This scene has some of the best ADR, including Shervan as one of the New York renter thugs who come to kill Joe. Can I help you? We're well, just a little bit with him. And Fraser standing in for the editor, who for some reason has a warning system rigged up in case of New York renter thugs. Are you expecting anybody? No. That's a warning bell. The final round of dubbing was done in early February, at which point the movie was as complete as it was ever going to be. Happy birthday to you. You lost. You lost face. The director took his newborn to the American film market in the first week of March in order to shop it around, but the only interest came from Polish VHS distributor Video Rondo, which released or licensed it in various European territories including Germany. 
where it was given an ironic dub featuring Frank telling Joe to get a haircut and Captain Roma referring to him as a feather duster. So it was Germany that was first to find Samurai Cop funny, even without the original dialogue. You're the one that talked me into bringing this moron from San Diego to fight the J Japanese Katana Gang! By the way, what's an all-American girl like you doing with a geek like this? You and I got nothing to do. Let's f Shut up! Hannon suspects that deal netted Shervan more than his costs, which would technically make Samurai Cop a commercial success. But aside from a screener tape, there was no US release until 2004, when media blasters used their Guilty Pleasures imprint to release a DVD complete with Joe Bob Briggs' commentary. Look, he runs too close to a Ford Falcon and the vibes from the car knock him onto the concrete. <laughs> Now Samurai Cop is going to force him to talk, even though he could have stayed back at the restaurant and forced any of the three other guys to talk. Over the following years, clips from this release began to show up on YouTube, with one in particular, the scene of the nurse sexually assaulting and then undermining Joe, gaining notoriety. Doesn't interest me. Nothing there. Nothing there? Just exactly what would interest you? Something the size of a jumbo jet? Have you been circumcised? But things really blew up when filmmaker and alternative movie fanatic Greg Hatanaka stumbled on a 35mm print in a rundown LA studio. Audiences immediately went wild for its malarkey when he began screening it in 2013. What does katana mean? It means Japanese sword. Also, there are two other Japanese things, Shinjuku and Dinjuku. The reaction these screenings provoked helped convince Hatanaka a sequel was viable, despite Matt Hannon having sadly passed away. So he conceived a story about Frank teaming up with Joe's daughter to find her father's killer, but just a few months later, and completely out of the blue. Transpired Hannon hadn't died after all. The IMDb update everyone had taken for granted was erroneous, and he was merely keeping his head down. Eventually, his film student daughter convinced him to break cover, and much like the fans, Hatanaka was thrilled, promptly signing him up for a now reconfigured sequel, which, sadly, largely failed to recapture that lightning in a bottle. I was waiting entire my life of this. You think you have chosen one, Joe? I never claimed to be. The appeal of a good bad movie like Samurai Cop is entirely reliant on its unintentional deficiencies. Moments like Fraser's numerous magical cutaways, for which Shervan simply told him to stand in front of the camera and make faces, only work because the director used them sincerely. It's still a delight to see most of the cast reassembled though, many of them having long since retired and moved on to other things. Remember Alfonso Raphael, Federico Sebastian, the Raider? Guy was a major uh, gunrunner. Yeah. Should have seen the stockpile yet. Yeah, I knew he wasn't as goofy as he looked. Oh, he committed suicide. Yes! <laughs> when Samurai Cop was finished, or let's say stopped being made, Hannon went back to auditions and bodyguard work, this time for Arnold Schwarzenegger. But reasoning that, given his Hellenic appearance, it would make more sense to play on his Greek heritage than his Irish, he changed his name to Caridus which is how the world lost track of him. Frustrated to find industry figures often recognised him for his high-profile bodyguarding and didn't want to accept him as an actor, he didn't get very far, and a small role as a Serbian soldier in the pilot for JAG is about all he has to show for his post-Samurai Cop efforts. Instead of acting, he focused increasingly on stand-up comedy, finding it a more fulfilling creative expression. While establishing himself on LA's open mic circuit, he formed a friendship with Andrew Dice Clay, often opening for him at venues like the Comedy Store, where the Brooklyn legend's routine went down a storm. Maybe this is God's way of saying It's not going to go down a storm for YouTube. Bisexuals are my favourite. After starting a family with high school sweetheart Stephanie in 1992, Hannon felt the need to buckle down and get a real job but unfortunately not before hatching a scheme to appropriate a painting by Rembrandt from monkey-hating lunatic televangelist Gene Scott. Mark of the B six times. One, two, three, four, five, six. Over he goes. One, two, three, four, five, six. Over he goes. 
Hannon and cohort Kurosh Jadali, who's this guy here, landed in big trouble with the law, but that's another story. One Shervan could probably have turned into a terrible movie. Now you're talking. After a spell as a grip and with the arrival of a second daughter, Hannon, or by now Caridas, began a successful career as a union hiring foreman, attending trade shows all over America from his base in California, where in the late 2000s he watched in quiet amusement as the legend of Samurai Cop began to grow. I would uh, Google my name and that would still pop up and then I would see the posts and then the horny nurse stuff on YouTube. He's prepared to report for duty once again if the call comes, but probably more interested in spending time with his family. Mark Fraser eventually moved back to New York and then on to Florida to care for his mother. He did make a few further stage appearances though and also popped up as a NASA scientist in the pilot for Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman. 30 seconds and count. failure in the main panel. Due to a mechanical failure, we are suspending the countdown at 29 seconds. There she blows. Jobbing actors Melissa Moore, Jimmy Williams, Gerald Okamura and Robert Zadar put it all behind them and carried on with their careers. Melissa Moore worked steadily for the rest of the decade, appearing in all kinds of B-movies, perhaps the most popular being Sirio H. Santiago's Angel Fist, in which she plays a karate expert caught up in the Filipino underworld. Today, she's more focused on all things equestrian, having become a world champion saddleback horse breeder. You weren't expecting that, were you? The owner of a highly renowned stables in Kentucky, she's also won countless awards for her training. Despite that career shift, she still models and finds time to pop up in occasional movies, even reprising the role of Peggy for a cameo in Samurai Cop 2. Oh my god, Joe! Peggy, how are you? Oh god. Hannah, get out here! Are you my daddy? Uh... Jimmy Williams carried on acting and, having helped out as an uncredited producer on Samurai Cop, would combine the two disciplines more formally in movies including John DeHart's magnificent Get Even, which appears in my video on Vanity Projects, as, coincidentally, does his directorial debut Shadow of the Dragon, in which he plays a pasta-loving renegade cop. I gotta cut down on the lasagna. Today, he runs a wardrobe and prop store with his wife, Teresa. Gerald Okamura went on to become something of a legend by mixing big-budget mainstream movies like Stephen Summers' G.I. Joe The Rise of Cobra, in which he's the ninja master who trains snake eyes, with B-movies like Andy Sedaris' Day of the Warrior, in which he's a secret agent and an Elvis impersonator. Well, baby, you have no doubt, with all my love and will wear you out, I'm breaking, uh -huh. I'm breaking on me. Ooh. Robert Zadar was the biggest name among the cast back in 1991 and remains so today, despite never really repeating his early success. Perhaps because he was always vulnerable to the lore of bad filmmakers prepared to pay good money for on-camera cliches. Filmmakers like Jimmy Williams, in fact. Two men dead, another one injured, and a car blown up. There's chaos everywhere and the fire department's called to put out the fire. Why is it every time you two guys get together it ends up like World War III, huh? Seriously, Shadow of the Dragon's great. Sadly, Zadar passed away in 2015, just days before he was due to start filming on Samurai Cop 2. As for the more left-field actors, Cameron Oppenheimer became a bona fide member of the Star Trek family, fronting the Star Trek experience in Las Vegas and appearing in numerous roles in countless episodes and movies Genesis and First Contact, all while taking larger parts in a string of fairly predictable low-grade B-movies. The only thing I gotta be is naked. <sighs> Hang on a minute. Do they ship these actors straight from one location to another? Maybe more interestingly, she worked as a stand-in on Pulp Fiction, returned to Vegas for a spell with a burlesque show, and appeared as a featured extra in a number of well-known TV series, usually playing characters with names like Sexy Woman at Bar or Sexy Woman in Restaurant. Why can't I just walk up to a woman on the street and say hi? Is that so terrible? Oh, hi. <laughs> Janice Farley now runs an acting and model agency in Reno, Nevada, where she lives with her children and husband Rob Russo, an actor and frontman of the band Asphalt Socialites. Dale Cummings all but retired before passing away in 2005, and Cranston Kimura went back to his day job, although he jumped at the chance to reprise the role of Fuj Fujiyama in Samurai Cop 2. Are you excited to be back on set for Samurai Cop 2? No, I'm really not. A voice seems to haunt you. 
Sadly, Shervan never directed again and passed away on November 1, 2006 at the age of 77. His son Ben, a prosperous LA lawyer, now holds the rights to his films. Films that may have gone largely unnoticed when they were released, but that today bring untold joy to hundreds of thousands. How Shervan would feel about the nature of that joy is impossible to know, but I've spoken to a lot of filmmakers whose work is appreciated in the same unintended way, and it's very rare to come across one who isn't just happy that work's found an audience that values it. Why do you keep saying that? We're keeping it warm, Mr. Shervan. I can't get enough. Yes, that's going.